This is an interview with Pat Patrick Finnegan, New York State Military Museum, Saratoga Springs, New York, March 28, 2003, approximately 9.40 a.m. Interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Uh, Patrick Joseph Finnegan, on November 23rd, 1947, uh, St. Mary's Hospital, Brooklyn. Okay. Um, prior to entering military service, what was your, was your educational background? High school. Bailey High School. I was very, uh, uh, Bailey High School. I had 16 credits. I was out the door. Okay. High school was just something to get out of the way so I could get into the military. All right. Did you enlist or were oh, you yeah. drafted? I enlisted. Why did you enlist? I had never, I had never thought about doing anything else. From my earliest memories, that's that's all I wanted to be was a soldier. Uh, my original game plan was to be a marine. Uh, I had an uncle, uh, uh, Jack Finnegan, my father's brother, uh, and he had been a marine in Guadalcanal. He wasn't a grunt; he was a, a mechanic uh, on the Corsairs, I guess it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know. I just, I always. I think I liked the uniform, you know, and, uh, I liked the movies, I, I don't know why, I just was enamored of war and uh, defending my country. And, uh, and then my older brother, uh, not my eldest, my older, uh, he, was, he was in the army, he was uh, on his way to being a career officer, he was a little indecisive at that time, but he was already an officer. And, he was up in Fort Greeley, Alaska, doing weapons testing, and uh, he came home on leave in June of '66. Already assigned to the 101st, and I saw that 101st patch, and that was more impressive than the Marine uniform. So now I, was, I decided I was going to be a paratrooper, and that's when I went and uh, enlisted, and asked the recruiter if he thought there was any chance I could be a airborne infantryman. And I guess he laughed to himself and uh, uh, he said, well, I didn't think it'd be a problem. Now, when did you enlist? I went in the 1st of August, 1966. Mm -hmm. okay. Could you uh, tell us where were you inducted and where did you receive your basic and so on? Uh, Fort Hamilton, Brooklyn, I went in. That's how I went into the service. And uh, I hoped it would, you know, I hoped I would have gone to Fort Dix, but uh, they shipped us down to Fort Fort Jackson, was there a Fort Jackson, South Carolina, yeah. mm -hmm. for three days of, you know, whatever it was. And then it was on uh, Fort Gordon, Georgia for basic. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, I was qualified, I qualified for OCS and uh, I was going to be an officer, so I signed up for uh, OCS infantry and uh, uh, we were told that was going to be at Fort Dix, uh, New Jersey, at, and the uh, AIT of it, I mean, most of the, the infantry would have been at, the OCS would have been at Benning, but I guess even that early in 66, they realized they were going through a lot of junior lieutenants, and they were jumping the gun a little bit, and they had started this program of where your AIT, everybody in my AIT, eventually where I wound up, we were all OCS candidates, we were all guys that were planning on going OCS, not necessarily all infantry. So uh, we got a two-week leave, and I go home, and I think I'm going to Fort Dix. And I'm home about three days, and I get a telegram, and they tell me my leave's been cut in half, and i got to be in Alabama Saturday. So I wound up taking the AIT at Fort McClellan, Alabama. Uh, we were like only the third uh, AI. It was Fort McClellan was mainly a WAC center, WAC nurses, I believe, and uh, we were like the only, we were like the third AIT class to go through there, and guys were falling into abandoned wells on the compass course, and, you know, they were still ironing out their uh, problems. And actually, I, I showed up, there was an airplane strike at the time, <coughs> and uh, I hooked up with some guys that I had met when we first went in. We all went in through Fort Benning, 
and went to basic together and we all took a train down and we got there early and they grabbed us, they grabbed the first 15 people that showed up for this class, this AIT, and put us in a, a, an LPC thing, leadership preparation course. And that was a two week thing and then they turned us into the training cadre of the AIT, turning us into the, you know, the, 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 I don't know what they call the students or what, you know, the student platoon leaders, student squad leaders, student company commanders, things like that. Then I graduated AIT, uh, and in that time, my brother uh, was severely wounded and, uh, when I was in AIT. Uh, he was in Vietnam then? He was already in Vietnam. He was a, a first lieutenant. Uh, I don't remember if it was B Company or C Company, 2nd, uh, 327th of the 1st Brigade of the 101st Airborne. And, uh, they were on a patrol and they got ambushed and he jumped to the side and, uh, you know, just like the Vietnamese had planned it for him and he landed right on a, a punji stake and uh, an infected one and he got, he got really, uh, they did some nasty damage in, internally to him. Uh, I just dropped a picture off downstairs that was, uh, it was taken in Tuiwa. Uh, the 1st Brigade used to be south. They worked south, and then I, I, I guess over the years in Vietnam, they eventually worked their way north to where they wound up, you know, up way through by it near the DMZ. And uh, it was two while I was down south. And uh, this was taken in August of 66, and you can see he's a fairly robust looking guy. And then that picture of him with the helmet, he, he you know, he, how did this guy get in the service? You know, he looks like he's didn't look like he was serving, should have been in the service, let alone the airborne. And so that was a, that's why I brought that picture in. It shows what that. So anyway, I, I was, I'm not a patient person. I never have been. And, and at 55, I doubt I, I'm ever going to be. And uh, I, I had to get to Vietnam. I had to. <laughs> so I, I dropped out of the OCS program and. Uh, uh, tried to get my airborne back, and I got it back. Uh, I didn't know that I would get it back. Because uh, uh, you had to sign all these waivers of all your enlistment promises once you signed up for the OCS program. And, uh, but, you know, they gave it back to me. They needed paratroopers. And uh, as it was, the way I went into uh, uh, jump school, I missed zero week, which was... Well, I didn't really miss it. I just wasn't assigned anything. I just showed up to Benning, and nobody really knew I was there. And so I just, I had learned how to skate pretty early in the Army, and uh, I just didn't show up for formations and hit on top of, I wasn't doing police calls at KP or any of that crap. I was here to fight a war. Let me fight the war, and, you know. Uh, so then I finished jump school, and uh, that's, I'm talking about the 173rd, they had just, they just jumped in Iraq, and when I was in jump school in February, March 67, they had just jumped in uh, Vietnam at the start of, I believe it was called Junction City, that operation. So that was a big, you know, everybody was, you know, I mean, getting the jump wings was one thing. Getting that little gold star that went on the jump wings for a combat jump, that was, that was the, you know, that was the cherry on the, on the Sunday. And, uh, you know, since then, people say, oh, "How could you jump out of plane?" How could, you know, I tell them, and it's, and it's, you know, I say it, and I'm saying it now. Here, there was nothing to it. All you had to do was sign your name on that piece of paper saying you were willing to go, and the army took care of the rest of it. All you had to do was stay. I think my number was A347 in the jump school, and you were never referred to by name. You were, you were that letter and that number, and that's all you were. And as long as I stayed behind A346, there was no problem. They would take care of the rest. They just, and, then it's just, and then it's just peer pressure. You don't want to be the guy that drops out. You know, you don't want to be the guy that drops out of the run. You don't want to be the guy that, you know, starts crying like a little girl when you had to go up in the 250-foot tower. You don't want to be the guy that ain't going to go out the 34-foot tower. You know, damn sure don't want to be the guy that chokes in the, when they open up the door and the, and the stick starts 
from going out. But at that point, most everybody's puking, and you can't wait to get out anyway. <laughs> you know, everybody's slipping and sliding, and I mean, they're not comfortable rides. And well, that's, you know, they do that to, 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 I guess, to weed you out to see who's gonna, you know. And they do the contour flying where they're gonna stay, you know, like 15, let's say 2,000 feet above whatever's below. And the, the ground rises 500, they go up 500. It drops 300, they drop 300. Then you come into the drop zone and they go from that 2,000 or wherever they are to the 1,500 or the 1,250. I forget, 1,250 I think it was. And it's like this, you know, and you, whoa. You know, and your stomach's still 400 feet above you and then they open the door and out you go. And Benning was hot. I jumped at Bragg when I, mean, I got assigned to the 82nd. That was, that was like a beach. But Benning was that big Georgia clay. and you, you hit hard. So that's you now we're up to there. Um, what kind of specialized training did you have? I was trained 11B. You know, infantry. That's uh, like I said, I was in... Uh, the AIT, even though some of us weren't going to infantry OCS, we were, it was all infantry AIT. It was OC, we were, we were, our AIT, we were, the emphasis was more on being a platoon leader than being a, a member of the platoon. Though there was certainly that aspect of it, because we're only in the service a couple few months. Uh, but we were all, we all got 11 Bs out of there. Some of them went off to uh, Fort, Belvoir or Fort Lee for supply and some went out to uh, uh, Knox for uh, armor and some went to I don't know where it would have been for artillery hood maybe or something I don't I don't know uh, but anyway I was trained 11B uh, I went through Catholic grammar schools and uh, they were constantly uh, in Catholic high schools and they were well for the first two years we can't, I mean, we constantly took tests, you know, these, uh, now they call them California, it's the cat tests. So I don't know what they call them when we took them, but we, I was very, I did good at that stuff. I was very good at that. I could have done better in high school, but like I said, it's, it's just something to get out of the way. And we weren't raised, you know, that has a lot to do with it. I don't know that there's many kids that naturally grow up and say to themselves, you know, I really like school. I think I'll just keep going. I think it's how your parents condition you. And we were not conditioned for college. My, my father uh, made it through eighth grade. His father made it through sixth grade. Uh, you know, you get out, you work. That's what you do. And uh, so I, I wasn't even thinking about going to college, but I did good on those tests. I had a very high GT score. I had a, a 144 I tested at. It didn't mean anything to me, but it meant a lot to them, the Army. So when I... At a jump school, because I've been asking for the 101st, 1st Brigade, every, I must, I don't know how many times, whenever they asked you, what do you want to do, that's what I told them. I want to be in the infantry, in the 1st Brigade, of the 101st, in RVN. That's where I want to go. And that's all I ever answered whenever it was asked. And, of course, at a jump school, they assigned me to Fort Bragg. And I call home, and I'm crying on the phone, because I... I can't go to the war, and you know what? Are they? I'm, I'm figuring my mom's pulled, did something because my brother's there, and she ain't gonna have both of us there, and she don't know what I'm talking about because, you know, she didn't have anything to do with it. So I get the brag and uh, come into the repo depot there, and uh, uh, the 82nd Airborne at that time, though it was in transition, it started to change. But at that time, it was still pure airborne. Everybody in the hundred in the eighty second was airborne. I think the hundred and first was the first one to stop being pure airborne. But all the cooks in the eighty second were airborne. All the clerks in the eighty second were airborne. Uh, everybody in the eighty second was jump qualified. You don't get. They didn't seem to get enough people that came out of. Uh, that enlisted to go to Benjamin Harrison to be personnel clerks or finance clerks or company clerks. They didn't get a lot of them that then went on to jump school. So they, they, they 
canvassed the scores and they pulled the people basically that were 110 GTs or better and uh, turned us into clerks. And uh, the people that had the highest GTs, they turned us into finance clerks. They figured, you know, because the GT score was basically a literacy and a, and a math ability test. And uh, they figured we could, you know, do that job. Though it was, you know, it was, it was just addition and subtraction and multiplication. There was no, was any, you know, I don't even remember. There was algebra aspect to it. So I got turned into a, a, a finance clerk, which I did not want to be. Uh, I didn't want anything to do with that. And after, and then I got promoted, so that turned my 11B into my secondary. No, after a while, I, first I got a, just a, a clerk typist MOS, a 70A1P. And, I, then I had, and that became my primary, and my 11B became my secondary. Then I got promoted to finally to PFC, and uh, that made me uh, a 73C. 2P, I think, or maybe a 1P, I don't remember, uh, and made my 70A my secondary, and I thought my 11B dropped off. But I'm still trying to get to Vietnam, and without much success. And uh, then I got in trouble, then I, uh, I don't know if I want to go into that too much. But, uh, actually, I don't. But uh, uh, but I kicked. I stayed there at Bragg. Uh, I got there in March of '67, and I went from being a finance clerk to being a. I came back into the 82nd Admin Company, and I was a supply clerk. And then uh, they started me as a supply clerk, and I could do that. So they moved me to uh, operations clerk, and I could do that. And then they turned me into a company clerk. Uh, I was the company clerk. I was the radar O'Reilly of the 82nd uh, Airborne Division. Uh, the general was on my morning report. The staff judge advocate was on my morning report. The division surgeon was on my morning report. And I was a 700. I had 700 people on my morning report, and uh, which I didn't mind that. I mean, you know, now I'm getting used to being a, a, a clerk and being in the states and going home when I can and seeing my girlfriend and. And and also, there's guys that are coming back from Vietnam. Guys that are coming back from the 101st. Guys that are coming back from the 173rd. Guys that are coming back from the airborne battalions of the, uh, uh, the 1st Cav. And I'm hanging out with these guys and partying with these guys. And they're, they're telling a whole different story than what the training cadre was telling me. And uh, so, you know, little by little, my gung ho was. was, was In what ways was it different? Well, pretty much they said what they told us in training was bullshit. You know, this is, uh, these people do not want us there. Uh, that's it, you, you know, you, you find this, you're going to find yourself in a situation where you got to shoot everybody because you don't know who's, who's the good guys and who's the bad guys. And, uh, you know, there was no winning the hearts and minds. There is no... Uh, If you think that you, and they had trouble perceiving a threat to America, which uh, I remember in high school and telling people I'm going to the service, they said, why are you going to do that? I said, well, you got to do it. You got to fight these communists. If we don't fight them there, we're going to be fighting them on the shores here. Well, if the Vietnamese, if they started their invasion, they ain't got here yet. And, you know, most of their sandpans probably sunk before they, got past Hawaii, uh, well, you know, they, it was just a, and I, I'm not, these are guys, I'm not, these guys were, were grunts. They got, they came back. These are guys that went over out of jump school. When that's when they, they you know, you're 18 out of jump school, 19. You're out of jump school, you're invincible. You're at the peak of your killing potential. Marines, they don't mean anything. What is a Marine? A bunch of faggots, everybody knows that. You know, to take ten of them to deal with one of us. Uh, I mean, you're right. You're you. That's that's when they went over. And if I had gone over at that when I was like that, I don't know how it would have wound up. But 
you know, they saw what they saw, and these are guys from Doc Toe, these are guys from the I Drang. I knew I Drang people. Uh, I knew Doc Toe people. I knew Carpenter, Crispy, Critter people. Uh, then, you know, you had the other guys with their rear collections, and I mean, you had the whole spectrum, but you had a lot of guys that uh, uh, really questioned, you know, what, 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 what's going on here? What are we doing? Uh, was it worth it? I guess that's what it boils down to. The, the interview with the guys wounded in Iraq the other day, and the one guy said, uh, and you can't say it better. You enlist for your country, you fight for your friends. That's You wind up fighting for the guy that's next to you who's going to be fighting for you. And, the, you know, and the guy to the other side of you. That, uh, you know, a lot of that, you know, uh, grab the flag and charge into the battle stuff goes away as soon as the battle starts. Uh, so anyway, I, I, had a, I had a really good first sergeant. Uh, a guy by the name of uh, Fanning. I don't remember his first name, uh, First Sergeant Fanning. And he left. I mean, he was my First Sergeant when I was company commander, uh, company commander, company clerk. He left and uh, uh, went to, I want to say, four, a four, 46 Special Forces, though. I don't know why I want to say that, but I think that's what it was. It wasn't like seventh group or third group or whatever it was. It was it was it was like a sub thing within special forces. He went to Thailand, and that was another thing. I mean, when I was a finance clerk, because special warfare center is there at Bragg also. The, the snake eaters. Uh, uh, we would get guys assigned to our units that we were doing the paperwork on in the 82nd, out of uh, one of the special forces groups, get them assigned to us, and then they would uh, uh, get discharged from the Army from us. And then two, three months later, they would come back to us, and then after a little while, go back to special forces. So I don't know what they did in between, but that stuff happened. Uh, you know, some sort of, they went off and did whatever they did, and the paper trail showed they weren't special forces whenever they were doing what they were doing. Uh, anyway, Sergeant Fanning, he went off to Tideland, and then I got this other first sergeant, and uh, I don't remember his name. I don't want to remember it. And, uh, oh, I was just going to have a lot of trouble with him. A lot, a lot, a lot of trouble. And, uh, I'm going to wind up at Leavenworth if I stay here. So I, my brother, I called my brother, and uh, he knew a guy that he had been, it's mentioned in some of those letters that I dropped off about my brother after he got killed from this Lieutenant Colonel Rafferty. He was at the time my brother got killed, but he was a major at the time. Anyway, he was up in the Pentagon, and he was something to do with assigning E6s and below. And he says in the letter, he mentioned, he was a letter to my parents, he said he, he remembered trying to help me get a reassignment. He didn't remember the particulars and didn't even know if it worked, but all of a sudden, boom, you know, I, I get a Twix, comes down, and I'm off to Vietnam. But I'm my own company clerk. So uh, I wanted 45 days leave, and that's what I took. I, you know, and it, it really was... I don't know if you, if you guys bounced around the, the orderly rooms much, but it really was, maybe not exactly, but it was a lot like MASH with Radar O'Reilly. And the company commander, all he cared about was that the papers you put in front of him were in order. And when he signed his name, he was a happy man, as long as you weren't selling the trucks out from under him or something like that, you know. So I gave myself a 45-day leave, and uh, off I go. And... Uh, and I get to Vietnam. I don't remember exactly when. It was a lonely time. It was in between Christmas and New Year's of 68. I would say maybe about the 29th or the 30th I hit Vietnam. And uh, I'm, 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 like I said, my MOSs have been bounced down. And I'm going over as a 73 C2P. And uh, this is great. I don't want anything to do with that infantry stuff. 
Now, from what I'm hearing, this is, I don't know, who wants that crap? Put me, you know, somewhere in the, you know, four levels down in a nice air-conditioned office in Saigon, and uh, I'll push your papers and let me finish up my time and go home. So I went, go, we landed in Long Bend, and, uh, you know, I guess I didn't land at Long Bend, I, but that, that was the base camp that went with whatever airport was with Long Bend. And they put us in this truck, this uh, bus, and it's got these the wire mesh all over the windows. And I don't know, you know, this, what is this for? So grenades can't come in and this and that. And for, the first impression, I, uh, uh, I said, oh, I'm not going to be able to breathe in this place. The humidity, the heat, it was. Uh, uh, this is not. Uh, this ain't. This ain't normal. And I'm like supposed to last a year here. And now we're driving from Long Bend to the 90th, I think that's what it was, 90th Repo Depot uh, in Long Bend, I guess, well, wherever we were driving from to that. And I'm, and I'm noticing the Vietnamese, and uh, they. Nobody's waving flags, you know, hey, you know, here's our liberators, you know, they don't look happy to see another busload of GIs coming into their country. I, that stuck in my brain. And uh, so I get there and I'm still hoping, you know, 73 C2P, you know, let me Mac V someplace, please. Boom. 173rd they give me. 173rd Airborne. Oh man, I don't want this. I don't know where it is or what they're doing. I don't even. I don't want to be a finance clerk in the 173rd. I don't want anything to do with that stuff anymore. And uh, I get up to the 173rd. Their base camp was an NK at the time, and I'm coming through. And uh, lo and behold, they need a company clerk for. Uh, uh, to, to run the admin company for the 173rd Airborne Brigade. And they don't know where he's going to come from. Well, here he is. Here I am. And so I figured, and there was a first sergeant there, a guy of some renown, uh, Machine Gun Bryant, they called him. Uh, I think it was the name he got from uh, the Korean War. He was an older, elder guy, older guy, older black guy. I don't think he got it from Vietnam. He, he don't look like he'd been uh, out on the field recently, and, uh, and he wanted me. You know, I told him, you know, I did the I did the 82nd Admin and Bragg. I can do your, you know, you ain't got your people aren't even going anywhere like these guys were hopping all over the place. You know, this is light duty. So he really wanted me, but then there was this warrant officer and the personnel who. Uh, knew about the trouble I had got in at the uh, uh, back at Bragg and he said there's no way this guy is meaning me is getting anywhere near any paperwork he's going to the field I said well, I can't go to the field I don't even have an infantry MOS anymore it's over two years these are your regs your regs say I haven't had this MOS in two years you can't. I wasn't even trained with a 16 I've never even had a 16 I was trained with a 14 what do you mean I'm going to the and I went to the IG, and uh, who turned out to be uh, another guy of, uh, at that time was Lieutenant Colonel Anthony Herbert, who uh, he was the IG at the 173rd when I got there in January of '69. He went on to be the second battalion commander, and there's a whole what a there there that how I thought of it, and a lot of us thought there were lifers and there were career soldiers. And Machine Gun Bryant wasn't a lifer. He was a career guy. And Herbert wasn't a lifer. He was a career guy. The first sergeant I was getting away from in Bragg, he was a lifer. And uh, and it, Herbert's driver there at the, at the IG in NK was a guy by the name of Clark who had done a tour with my brother. Uh, he was out of Texas, done a tour with my brother back in 66 uh, or 67, who had come to Bragg and then gone back to Vietnam, and I knew him at Bragg. I mean, the Airborne kind of went back and forth to the same places. And if you're in 
if you're in that paperwork, paperwork world, you're going to bounce into the same people. And uh, he was another guy I ran into that knew my brother. I ran into a lot of guys that knew my brother. And uh, it certainly helped me. Uh, and it never hurt me. Uh, my brother had, had over three, my brother had a good conduct medal. He had over three years an enlisted man before he went to OCS. And he never lost sight of that. He, uh, you know, he, he, was, he was actually more comfortable, I think, with the enlisted men than with, than with the officers. Uh, he didn't like West Point as too much at all. He, he, I don't know if this is true, maybe, and if it is, I don't know if they'd ever admit it. He swore they had a code that they tapped out with the <coughs> West Point rings. And him not being a West Pointer, he was not in that inner loop and didn't know their code and didn't want to know. But uh, anyway, Herbert said, no, nah, we can't do nothing for you. You're going to the field. Like, okay, I guess I'm going to the field. And uh, so they shipped me up to uh, where the 1st Battalion was, uh, LZ Uplift, about 10 miles south of this place called Bangsang. <coughs> right on the coast uh, in the northern part of uh, Bindin province in uh, northern Tukor. But I don't know that this is where it is then. I have no idea where it is. I'm, I, that stuff I just told you I pieced together years later. As far as that was concerned, I was very simple and I think a lot of us were. You know, if privates, nobody bothers telling you where you are. I'm a private. I'm, you know, I'm I've been in two and a half years now, and the highest I've got was PFC, and I hit Vietnam as an E1. So that's, you know, a little, uh, I'm an E1 over two. Technically, as soon as you hit country, you were an E2. But whenever they asked me what's your rank, I told them E1, because I know one of two things is going to happen. Most often, the best from my point of view, is going to happen. They're going to say to himself, here's an E1 over 2. I don't need his aggravation. We're just going to leave him alone and, you know, we'll get him out of here as soon as we can. So that's what I did. So anyway, uh, I get there and I'm talking to the supply clerk who's outfitting me and, uh, you know, we figure out what type of people we are and, he tells me, oh, you, you definitely want the third platoon. Okay, you know, I'm going to stick that in the back of my brain and see what happens. So we're out there, and, uh, and I can't believe what they expected me to carry to begin with. I can't believe what they put it on my back. And I don't know that I got more coming, but I can't believe what I already got. And uh, the platoon sergeant, I guess it was, no, the first sergeant, I don't remember his name. It was a lot of life is there. I don't remember his name. He comes and tells me I'm assigned to the first platoon. Supply clerk tells me I want the third platoon. Okay. So I get on the helicopter and they take me out to this even smaller place called Elzy Pony. I don't know where that was. That was farther inland. Now we're getting into the mountains. Uh, Elzy Uplift was kind of in the foothills of the Central Islands. Ponies up in them. And I don't know where it is. I still don't know where it was. Never, it, it, I never saw it on a map. I have no idea where it was. I step off at Pony. I'm the only uh, uh, FNG guy coming in. The only FNG coming in. But not a cherry. You know, I'm, I've got two and a half years in now, folks. I'm not, uh, I'm not fresh out of jump school. I'm, you know, it ain't my first time around the block. But there's no way around not being an FNG. And uh, the platoon sergeant comes up to me and asked, he asked me what the, the guy, the, the company, whatever he was, the field sergeant, uh, he wasn't, the first sergeant was in the rear, he was never in the field. So I don't know what this guy's title was that was running a company in the field. Uh, he comes up and asks me what platoon I'm assigned to. So that tells me, well, he's asking, he don't know. Supply clerk told me third. First sergeant told me first, they're never going to sort this through. I tell him the third. He is happy. I was just talking about, we had rugs put in the other day and we had a, there was a problem. And, uh, and the problem was solved and the guy that, and once it was solved, the guy was happy. 
And that's what I was, I was telling this story to the rug guys yesterday. This guy, as soon as I told him third, he's, that's one of his problems is solved. He's off to bigger and better things, and they're never going to sort this out, and they never did, and it never even came up again. So he says, well, they're right over there. And I, <laughs> this is a, a dusty place to begin with. A lot of those little fire bases were dusty. All the vegetation has been pounded down, long gone. You got whatever sort of dirt you got in that part of Vietnam. You either got mud when it's raining, or you got dust when it ain't. And uh, I think we had red dust there, I'm not sure. And then the helicopters are coming in and out and everything, you know. It's just, uh, and here's these guys, these, you know, the nastiest looking bunch of people. Oh, man. And they're eating food out of their cans with their nasty hands, and they're, you know, nobody's washed. Oh, God, you know, like, the hell am I <laughs> in for here? And uh, <clears throat> then all of a sudden I, I hear, hey, Pat. And, look, and there's this guy, Dewey Ruiz. And uh, I've tried to run. He winds up getting killed. I try to write about this, and I can't convey or get across what it meant to know somebody, to get to that situation. A lot of, you know, you come in, most of it in the infantry anyway, you came in, some of the, like the first brigade, I guess they went over when they first went over by boat. The 173rd went out of Hawaii by boat. The first cab went over by boat. These, when the units first go, they went in mass units, and you're with everybody you know. Then, once that's done, you start coming in, one at a time, one or two at a time, whatever. And, uh, this, and do we, when, back when I was a finance clerk at Bragg, there was a, uh, we, there was just like the, think of a secretary pool, and that's, and we're all back there, and there's maybe four rows of desks, four rows deep, each row, and at, at each desk is two or three guys doing a battalion or half of a battalion of the 82nd. Up at the front of the whole thing is, is like a, a, one of those banister railings that you would find in a courtroom. And on the other side of that is the people that are running the show for us back here. As it was a, a major who was in charge of the finance officer. He was the finance officer. Then there was a lieutenant. He was, did whatever the lieutenant did there. Then there were two staff sergeants and one EM. And the EM's job, he was the radar O'Reilly of the finance office. And he could... Uh, he could either be a good guy or he could be not a good guy. He could make your job easy. All of us on the other side, he could make our job easy. He could make our job hard. You know, he could be sucking up to the people on that side of the railing or he could be with the guys he had to live in the barracks with. And Dewey, not that he was doing it because he had to live with the guys in the barracks, he did it because that's the way he was. He was a good guy. He made our job easier. He was another one that enlisted to be a grunt and wound up here and didn't want to be there. And He left on a levy for a, some airborne unit, or I don't even know if it was an airborne unit, but he left for the DMZ in Korea a little bit, about a year. I got there in January, Vietnam in January. I got the Dewey in January of 69. <coughs> Dewey left Bragg in October, November of 67. And uh, here's Dewey Ruiz. And, uh, you know, and Dewey knew what trouble I had got in at Bragg. And, you know, among enlisted guys, uh, I mean, there's a, there's a whole, there's a whole different sorts of hierarchies and pecking orders. And, you know, there's guys that get in trouble and guys that don't get in trouble. And you got your reputation or you don't have your reputation. And, and here's Dewey, and Dewey was a good guy at Bragg, and he's a good guy here, and Dewey was a good grunt. Dewey had only been there about three months. He got there in October of 68, but Dewey, you know, like we said, he had his shit. The guys were there, 
that, and were there for their whole year, and the day before they left, they still don't have their shit together. And Dewey was good. Dewey had his shit together. He was, he was walking, he was, you know. Different units ran it different ways. Like I, that was a big awakening for me when I came back. I figured every unit did the same things they didn't. A lot of units, they made everybody walk point. Uh, in fact, they put the new guys on point. You know, no sense wasting a, uh, one of the older guys when you can waste a new guy. The unit I had, the 170, this company, or maybe it was just this platoon of the 173rd, that isn't what we did. If you wanted to walk point, you let it known you wanted to walk point. These are your options. You could walk point, you could hump a radio, or you could be on a machine gun team. You take your pick. And uh, I was not walking point. I knew that much. And uh, But I'm, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here. And, uh, so anyway, you know, here's Dewey. And I had always got along with Dewey. And uh, it just, you know, I don't have to explain myself to a lot of people now. I don't have to come up with a whole bunch of bullshit to build up my, you know, Dewey's going to do it for me. I ain't got to do any of that. It was just, it was so, it made it, I didn't appreciate it at the time because you're living it. But, and then, you know, years later, like I got active in Vietnam veteran stuff as soon as I got back. And, uh, you know, and you hear the different stories. And, you know, I, I came to appreciate how much that meant to uh, running into Dewey there. And uh, so anyway, I, I don't remember much of the, <coughs> the rest of that evening. I think I got in just about dusk, a little bit before it got dark. I don't remember much. But I remember we, we humped out of this place, this LZ Pony at, uh, I don't know, I'd say maybe 3 in the morning, 2, 3 in the morning, I don't remember. The whole company humped out, headed out, went off to wherever we were going. And we're humping all night. And, you know, and I remember it was about 10 o'clock in the morning. Well, I don't know. I don't know what time it was in the morning. It was morning, and it was already, you know, it was earlier than ten. It was already unbearably hot and unbearably humid, and I'm, my pack is killing me, and I don't even know what what more I'm going to get. And uh, we're going up this little, like ravine, and uh, we stop, and okay, we're stopping for who knows what reason. I don't know why we're stopping. And then the word came down that we were lost. Oh, okay, this is interesting. And, uh, and the guys, two guys ahead of me, Harry the machine gunner, how honest do you want these things? It's what you want to say. Well, Harry breaks out his lerp bag. He had a lerp bag. We didn't get lerp rations too often. Every now and then we got them. I got to explain lerp rations? Yeah, probably. Yeah, for someone else that's watching this. Oh, <laughs> well, the lerp, lerp rations were, now they got the meal ready eats. Well, the lerps were the forerunners of the meal ready eats. They were called lerps because they gave them to the long range uh, reconnaissance patrol teams and they weren't cans and they didn't rattle. And uh, basically they were mostly rice based meals. They were rice with uh, rice with chili, rice with Rice with whatever they got, rice with ham, rice with whatever, you know. And uh, we didn't get them too often. But they came in this waterproof bag. It was like a water repellent. It was an, almost like a canvas, an outer green canvas, and then an inner a smooth waterproof seal. And then inside of that was the package, was the meal that was in a cellophane thing, and you, you added X number, you added whatever amount of water you added to it, and you... You, you heated it up uh, with the heat tabs, or which we never got. And so guys, would, you tore apart your you tore apart your claymore mines. You tore apart your armament to get stuff to heat your food because you you never could get the heat tabs. Oh, man. Uh, so Harry he breaks out his lerp bag, which doesn't have any lerp in it, but it's got a it's filled with uh, Vietnamese cannabis. And uh, he stuffs his pipe full and uh, lights it up and passes it down the line. And I said, okay, this, this must be where I'm at today. And, and that's where I was. And uh, 
somewhere during the night the company had split up and I don't even, now we're in platoons. And uh, and mostly that's what we want, mostly we worked. In, we, over the, the time I was in the field, that's occasionally we would start as a company and then branch off into platoons, but usually we started as platoons. Then occasionally we would come back as a company for resupply day, like every three, four days they would resupply us. And uh, the standard operation went anywhere from uh, three, four days you would be out on the field to two, three weeks out on the field. And uh, they would come in and resupply you. Anyway, I opted for the gun. T I tried the radio, and uh, that was just, that was, that was not for me. Uh, I, tr I tried the radio because it was going to be lighter than carrying ammunition. And I was already, as far as I was concerned, overloaded. Uh, but the radio had that big antenna that even when you, no matter what you did with it, it was going to get caught on the, on the stuff we're walking through. Plus you're a target. You know. So I wound up on the gun team and uh, now they gave me 400 on top of everything else I got. I got 400 rounds of machine gun ammunition. I got two cans of machine gun ammunition. Which uh, I came to understand weighed about 20 pounds each. With the can and the, and the belted ammo. So here's 40 pounds of machine gun ammunition. I don't know what water weighed at the time. I, I just retired from a wastewater treatment, so I learned what water weighs. That's 8.34 pounds per gallon. I'm carrying six quarts of water and wish I had more. I got 12, over 12 pounds of water plus the containers they're in. I got my M16. I got 21 magazines for my M16. I got uh, uh, three uh, fragmentation grenades. I got two smoke grenades. I got half a, a claymore. I either got the clacker or I got the uh, the exploder, the whatever you call the, that part of it. I got three or four days worth of, uh, of rations. I got uh, uh, some. Uh, did I say smoke grenades. Yes. I got I got some flare grenade. I got some flares, pop up flares. Uh, I got a law, uh, a blight anti, I don't know why it was called a lore, it was a light anti-tank weapon. So it should have been a, a latwa, but it was a, a lore. Uh, okay, I got a machete, I got a lot of stuff. And this guy's carrying more than me. I, I got a medic in my platoon, you can't see him. All you see is this, you see legs and, 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 and packs. That's all you see. You don't see his head. His head is, he's got packs on top of packs on top of packs, and you can't even see his head. Uh, the guy, one of the other guys on a gun team with me, Benny uh, Brandt from Alabama. Uh, he's carrying, he, Benny is not running out of ammunition. Benny's carrying over 40 magazines. He's got, he, I, I couldn't believe what we carried. I still can't. But I couldn't. Carry. When I, I was telling my kid the other day, we were talking about something, and we were talking about this. I talk about it a lot. And uh, I got back from Vietnam. I weighed 129 pounds, and uh, my pack had to be over 80. I don't know how I did that. I don't know how any of us did that. And guys carried more than that. I don't know how. I don't know how you do it. I don't know how you... Well, you well, what are your choices? You either do it or you face whatever they say you're going to face if you say you ain't going to do it. And once you're out there doing it, you ain't got any options. You've got to keep doing it. Uh, anyway, I don't know. I, ask me something else. Well, uh, did you carry this load every single time that you... you every, know, time, every time. Every time. Every time. Um, what was the purpose of your patrols? Why were you out there? Bait. That is the best I can figure. I, that's what I came to conclude. We were out there as bait. We were out there 
because somebody had studied something at West Point and they wanted a pitch battle. They wanted their, they wanted to do I Drang over and over again. They don't want these little, you know, piss ass platoon firefights. They want, they want to close with the enemy and wipe them out. And we're out there just being the bait. Hopefully our platoon will run into something and, and they'll bring in more and we'll bring in more and uh, you know, I was right at the uh, break of whatever, into the pacification, right at the beginning of the Vietnamization of the war, I, I think. I'm not, I, I, that part of it, I'm not really sure. Uh, you know, that's, but it's, you got, the most we ever had out there, here's another thing, you know, they, well, you, an infantry platoon is 44 people, that's, uh, you got, you know, three squads of a, no, we never had more than 26 people. And usually we were more in the 22, 23, 24 range. You, we had at one point in time, we were never, our company was never up to full strength, and I don't know that any of them ever was. And we're, the 173rd Airborne was supposed to, in the Army's mind, it's one of their elite of the elites. You know, we are just a, a cut to the bone, infantry unit and uh, right uh, we had uh, we couldn't get jungle fatigues all the jungle fatigues the guys are running out, everybody in the rear had the jungle fatigues we couldn't get jungle fatigues talking about how we they had these little blue heat tabs they looked like blue alcacelsas and that's what you're supposed to heat and they came like two in a pack or four in a pack and you it came in a, like an aluminum thing, and you're supposed to light them, and that's uh, how you heated your food. If that's call that stuff they gave us in the cans, and uh, or you heated your cocoa or your coffee. We didn't drink much coffee; we mostly drank a lot of cocoa. And uh, but you could never get them either. And uh, so guys would take apart their claymore mines and get the C4. The C4 you only needed the tiniest little bit. And it heated it virtually instantaneously. You didn't have to wait. And sometimes time was, well, time always seemed critical to young kids. And, uh, there's another story in there, but uh, so. How often did you make contact? We didn't. I'm very, very thankful to say that. Generally speaking, my the AO I was in was quiet. You know, I'm very happy to say that. It was, I since came out, came to find out. Bindin Province had always been a very uh, strong nationalist area. It was one of the few uh, areas that really rose up in the Tet Offensive of '68, and I got squashed pretty bad. And their whole infrastructure was was kind of shot. So by the time I got there, and I also think they were possibly protecting the colors of the 173rd at that time. They had been through some nasty things and, you know, it was just a brigade and they, you know, out of there's like, I think we got, 173rd's got 1,800 on the wall in Washington, which is a big contribution out of 56,000 of, of a brigade. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we made contact the second night I was there, but I was never, I was never in anything like, like what you saw in the, the uh, the movie We Were Warriors by my pa. I was never like in anything that I I I think my brother went through. Mm -hmm. You know, mostly we were. But even with that, even with that, and you know, we had twenty five percent casualties. Booby traps here, snipers there, uh, friendly fire, uh, friendly fire, friendly fire do a, does a lot of damage. You know, and, and, and I'm talking, I'm not talking about airstrikes on us. I'm talking about just miscommunication within the platoon. Guys going out, you set up for a logger, and then half of your, some of your people go off and go off on a patrol or an ambush, and they come back, and nobody knows how to read the map, and they come, they tell you they're coming back from the south, and you've got movement coming in from the north. Next thing you know, and I, that guy I mentioned on my gun team, Benny, he shot this, we got a guy in a platoon uh, from Texas, shot him in his leg, shot him, I don't know, 
I, I hope they save his leg. I hope they saved his life. Uh, he, you know, he's got him in his femur, his femur artery, and uh, you know, and Benny's got to live with that. Benny knows he did it, but you know, the platoon's supposed to be coming in from the other direction. You know, and you don't know. Mm -hmm. the closest I came to, to, to actually seeing somebody, I mean, I fired my weapon mostly. I don't know what the hell I was firing at. I didn't see anything. You know, I, I think I heard something and that shit happened. And well, I'm the closest I came. There was a there was one of those spotters, one of those uh, Piper Cubs or whatever the the army had that got shot down. And uh, uh, it was the only thing I ever volunteered for. And we were back in the rear. We were on stand out on the rear, and they they asked the people to go out and. They, you know, they, I forget if we were looking for the pilots or looking for the plane or what we were doing. So it was about 10, I don't know, 15 of us went out. And uh, and we get to where, you know, they dropped us off and now some of us are going to stay there and the rest of us are, are going to go off and do whatever we were supposed to be doing. I forget what it was. It was shot down by, a, they told us, by a 51 caliber. So I guess by the by the time we got, they dropped us off. My senses came back, and I said, well, "I ain't going." Okay, that's I don't know why I'm, I even volunteered to get here. I'm not going on that part of it. If they got a 51 caliber, they got some heavy shit, and uh, you know that's not one or two guys. I mean, that's you know, and I wasn't sure, but I remembered the pictures of what they're, you know, it's a thing with shoulder harnesses on it. You know, I'll stay here. Uh, and off they go. And uh, so I'm out on, you know, pulling my guard duty. And uh, should I stop? No, no, no. I'm off pulling my guard duty. Most of the platoon is here. And I'm one of the, the guys that stayed back. And I'm over here pulling my guard. And somebody else is over. You know, we were the, the outpost of this, you know, center thing. So all of a sudden I got movement. And I ain't supposed to be having movement. And you know, from the friendlies, I got movement coming in, and it's all of a sudden it's there, and it's it, and it's too close for me to, you know, make noise or or, or tell anybody what's going on, and uh, and I'm you know I'm getting ready, and uh, uh, and then all of a sudden there 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 is the movement, and it was this I can't remember his name, uh, Chicano guy from uh, uh, California, little guy. Uh, dark, uh, not wearing his helmet. We didn't wear our helmets whenever we could get away with not wearing our helmets. You know, they, they just, you know, you don't, it's, well, you know, it's, it's just too, you were up there flying around in a big air conditioner from our point of view. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, and here he is, and he's dark, and he's dirty, and he's little, and he ain't got a helmet, and he came very close to dying. If, if, if it was, you know, somebody a little more jittery, uh, uh, you know, he he would have taken a couple rounds in the chest. But that's the closest I came. And that, you know, that was, that's, you know, just a friendly, you know, just, I did a TV thing some years back. And they asked us about the difference between us and the, the Vietnamese. And uh, I said it was like, the difference was, it was like putting Boy Scouts uh up against hardened guerrilla fighters, and that's what it was. And these people got 20 years into the program at this time. I mean, they're, they're the toughest. You wound, I know, and you know, I know I feel this way, and I've talked to a lot of other grunts that feel the same way. You wound up having more admiration for the people that you were trying to kill than you had for the people that sent you there to kill them. Uh, we chased, this is when Dewey got killed. Uh, we ran into, uh, uh, we ran, We started out in company. It was one of those rare times we started out in company. And uh, uh, the lead, I, I don't know where our platoon was in the line of march, but we weren't in the lead. And the lead ran into something. And uh, I remember them seeing, it was this tall, skinny Vietnamese that were walking away from the site and he had been shot in the arm and, and you know so eventually we get up to where we're, we're getting up to and uh, uh, it chased these three Vietnamese into this tunnel complex and uh, 
here's these three Vietnamese, and here's this company of American paratroopers surrounding them. With all that we could bring, the Americans could bring to this situation. I'm going to have to uh, stop you right here. And we chased them into the yeah. We chased them into the tunnel complex, and uh, and we got everything that America can bring as far as armament, and materials, and whatever. And uh, these Vietnamese, they crawl up. We got ponchos over the the holes, so we could detect any movement whatsoever. These guys are coming up and throwing hand grenades out at us. They don't care that the whole United States Army's out there. That doesn't mean anything to them. They're coming up and throwing hand grenades. That's why I took a little, a piece came out, one of the grenades hit me in the chin there. Felt like it was, I got hit with a baseball bat. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's all it was. And Benny, uh, the other guy, by now, at this point, was I... Yeah, I'm still a gunner. I'm, I mean, not a gunner. I'm uh, still an ammo bearer. I wound up being a system gunner. But at this point, I'm still just the ammo bearer. And uh, Benny uh, wasn't... I took this first, and Doc put a Band-Aid on it. Bled like hell. All that, or, or you, you get cut in the head, uh, mm -hmm. hit in the head, and especially there with the humidity, and your blood is thinned down. And You know, I thought I was going to die from blood loss from this... You know, a little thing that's about this long. And uh, so then it was later on in the night, and uh, me and Benny were leaning against our packs. This was one of the... I don't know how many holes went into this tunnel, uh, but we were covering like three or four of them. And uh, we're leaning against our packs, and uh, all of a sudden, it's like, grenade! So we jump. To jump behind our packs, a grenade goes off, and Benny catches, he caught a bigger piece in his back. And Doc came over and pulled that out and put the Band-Aid on. I don't, I don't have a heart. Benny don't have a heart. Uh, Harry the gunner, he took a punchy stake through the, uh, stepped in a hole and took one, an old one. If it was infected, the inf whatever they infected with, it was, you know, long gone. But it went right through the flesh of his calf, like, about that, you know, pulled it out, bandaged it up. He don't have a heart. There's a whole... To get a purple heart, you had to fill out the paperwork. There was, you know, there was actually a, like a, a ticket stub. There was something that got torn and went back and, you know, and, and part stayed with you and part went someplace else. And So, I mean, there's a lot of guys out there that, that technically deserve a, you know, but you felt kind of, you know, I mean, you've seen guys get, you know, you've seen devastation to bodies, and here you've got something that they put a Band-Aid on. You know, you don't, but I wish they had it now. <laughs> Would have more civil service points. Uh, but you're not thinking civil service points at that time. And anyway, we're throwing down, they had these canisters of C CS, uh, I think there were 64 charges in the canister. I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that. We're throwing this down the holes. They ain't giving up. They ain't, they're not surrendering. We're sending people into the tunnels to get them. We're tying ropes around the people we're sending into the tunnels to get them so that we can pull them, our guys back out when they get shot. They never ran out of volunteers. There was a guy by the name of Lynch. He was, uh, he was the company RTO. He was the RTO for the company commander. That's the only It sticks in my mind, it was like five or six guys went into these tunnels and got shot. And, uh, and we pulled them back out. Lynch, I believe, lost his leg. I don't remember what happened to the other ones. Dewey volunteers to go in. Dewey takes a round through the back of the head. Dewey Ruiz from Georgia. Gosh. Made no sense. And then we, then we, we pull out of the place. 
after that, after Dewey got killed, they decided, okay, that's enough. Now we're just going to blow up these holes. The Vietnamese probably went a half mile underground and popped out someplace else anyway. You know, they turned Dewey from an E4 into a sergeant. He's on the wall as a sergeant. They gave him a silver star. They gave the company commander, well, he was probably due for captain anyway. He got a, uh, he became a captain. He went from first lieutenant to captain. They gave him a silver star. He didn't do anything but ask for the volunteers. That's all he did. He never, he didn't endanger him. His name was Smith. He didn't endanger, that came out of the back of my brain someplace. He, so you're saying about people don't talk about it. You don't talk about it. I mean, there's things you're never going to forget. You've been in the water. There's things you're never going to forget. But there's things you are going to forget if you're not, uh, you know. But I hadn't thought about Smith in a long time. And that, that always bothered me. He didn't, you know. They tried to, well, that's, I'm getting ahead of my <clears throat> Harry was getting court martial, the gunner. Uh, he had, you wind up with boils over there. You know, a lot of people want you. You're not keeping yourself as clean as you, you should. Your body's getting chafed. It's, it's just not a good, it's not a healthy environment. Away from the war aspect, it's not a healthy environment. And uh, Harry and a lot of guys had stuff, and some of them still jungle rot. And uh, well, Harry had it pretty bad, and... Uh, he had refused to do something back when he was an assistant gunner. He was a big guy, Harry. He was out of, he was out of Massachusetts. Arthur Clark Harrington III. Uh, three years at the University of California in zoology. And uh, dropped out of college. And I think he got hit with the draft or was going to get hit and he enlisted. So and then he's, he, he was uh, in the Special Forces program. You got a GT or 110 or better. They gave you the option, you know, that now the door's open for OCS, Special Forces, whatever they got. So uh, Harry's in the Special Forces and he's going to be a medic, which was, a, I believe, a year program. I don't remember exactly. It was one of their longer programs. But being a, a, a medic in Special Forces, you're damn near a, a, an emergency room doctor. You know, and you're going to be seeing things that emergency room doctors don't see. And uh, he was nine months... Uh, uh, into that, then uh, he got in uh, some hassle with a, an E7 and knocked him out, and uh, that was the end of his special forces training. And he wound up as a grunt and, uh, and busted down in, uh, in the 173rd. Well, he's good people, Harry. Well, anyway, he was getting court martialed, and uh, I had to go testify at his court martial. And that's right around when Dewey got uh, killed. And uh, then a little bit after that, I developed uh, uh, a boil uh, on my right testicle. And uh, it's pretty aggravating, and, it, and, you know, and, it's, and it's looking like it's getting infected. And, uh, you know, I don't want to... I go and I talk to the medic, the guy I told you about, Doc Villar, uh, Carmelo Villar big story with, Carl, with Doc Villar, a big Puerto Rican kid from the Bronx. And uh, big, you know, for Puerto you don't think of Puerto Rico, Doc is 6'1", he was a boxer, uh, went about 180 when he got there, he's probably down about 150 by now. And uh, the platoon medic was also a Puerto, the, the company uh, medic was also a, a Puerto Rican guy from the Bronx. Uh, Doc was a conscientious objector. <laughs> he came into the platoon and uh, he's not going to carry a weapon he's not, you know he was carrying everything he'd get his hands on before too long he stopped being a CO and, uh, and all the Puerto, a lot of the Puerto Ricans wound up being tunnel rats because they were the little guys so Doc's got this whole other thing going on you know, because he's, he's you know, he's, he's got his Puerto Rican life he's got to live and he can't deal with so here's this big <laughs> you know Larry Holmes looking guy volunteering to go in the tunnel so that he can, you know, so he can hold his head up with all the other guys from the Bronx. And, uh, so anyway, he, uh, they got me out of, they got me out of the field to Quignard. 
to have this uh, dealt with. And uh, uh, they, uh, they, they took care. It was a sebaceous cyst that got infected. I thought it was a boil, but it was just a, you know, basically a sweat pore that plugged up and backed up and got infected. And they saw I, I got this drain tube hanging out of my right testicle, and I'm there in the hospital, 67th back in Quignan. That was a show. And uh, a quick little side story there, there's this 19-year-old California surfer lerp. And uh, this one night just, I'm 21 at the time, man, you know, just to mention. I'm, I turned 21 right before I got to Vietnam. I turned 21 in November of, of uh, 68 and got there, and, you know, a little bit later. I'm one of the oldest guys in my platoon. Harry was older, and that was it. And uh, and then I was, half of the time, I had three or four different platoon leaders in the time I was in the field, and I was older than half of them. <coughs> anyway, this 19-year-old surf alert, uh, we're talking, he's, you know, I don't know if he was full of crap or what, but uh, he, he was a legitimate lerp. I mean, you could, you could sift through the bullshit you know, pretty easy, and, uh, you know, there was certain things that, you know, were going to be true, and, and, and if they didn't know him or didn't, you know, and then he's talking, geez, have you ever kill anybody with a knife? You ever just sneak up on him? No. No, I never have. Don't. <laughs> That's, I mean, I, I guess I'm saying that, I mean, it's, it's, this guy was over the edge. You're not killing people with knives at this point, you know, to save democracy. He's found a twisted little corner of himself, and, and you know, something, uh, and that's something that, that, that troubles me. It's, uh, we sh you know, we shouldn't have been asked to do these things. We shouldn't have been put in these situations. You know, like Callie. I mean, Callie had a, Callie was another one. He was, there was something, something ain't right with this guy. But he never should have been put in that situation. He shouldn't have been put in command of a platoon of people. You know, and, and if, if, as soon as, if, if you cross that line, you're killing, you're killing indiscriminately. I mean, it, it, it sounds kind of high and mighty for me to, you know, be saying, but I don't have these ghosts that I got to carry around with. And I think a lot of that has to do with being a little bit older. And maybe... Being exposed to a, uh, talking with guys that have been through things, and uh, you know, just not having a winging at the moment, I got a winging, you know. Uh, 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 Cali. <laughs> uh, anyway, so I'm 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 leaving the 67th back, and uh, I got which is in Quinyan, and I got to come through 1K uh, to get back to, El to get back to the 1st Battalion. And as I'm coming through 1K, they don't, turns out they need somebody that can do morning reports. Not for the 82nd Admin, uh, I mean for the 173rd uh, Admin Company, but to do morning reports for the 1st Battalion. Well, and again, it's the same situation. They don't have anybody showing up that knows how to do them. And uh, well, I let them know I know how to do them. So paperwork has moved around. I'm still, and I was never not assigned uh, to the line unit as a line person. But now I'm pulled out of that job, and I'm doing morning reports at on K for two of the companies of the, of the 1st uh, Battalion, of the 1st of the 503rd, 173rd. <laughs> Man, this is great. I got three hours of work, tops a day. The rest of the day is my own. I got a sergeant, an E6, and maybe he's an E7, who's nominally in charge of me, but he's drunk most of the time. And as long as the job is done, he could care less. I got another guy, they, I don't remember his name, that I'm working with. He is also getting ready to leave. He leaves. In comes Benny O'Donnell Taylor III. Benny served a tour also with my brother and 
I don't know. I, he might have been with my brother when my brother was a company commander in the second uh, out of 327th. I don't remember where Benny fit in with that. Benny is an OCS dropout. He was actually in the program and then dropped out. He had, uh, and then he re-upped, and uh, and now he's in Vietnam, uh, Vietnam in the 173rd. And he was an E5, I think, at that time. And it's me and Benny and the sergeant. The sergeant goes away. Benny moves into the, the sergeant's spot as the PSNCO for the 1st Battalion. And at that point, I, I give you, you know, you, there was a lot of racism going on at the time, and and you know, there's a lot of black militancy going on, and uh, and it was, we were almost like in a transitional uh, period during those years. And you you talk with guys later in the war, and you know, uh, depending upon the branch or whatever. And uh, anyway, there was a, there was a, but in my platoon. As, as a Caucasian, I was a minority. A lot of blacks, a lot of Puerto Ricans, a lot of Asians, Native Americans, uh, you know. Uh, and uh, I don't know, I, I, I grew up, you know, as racist as most white kids grew up. And uh, a lot of that got brushed off me in Vietnam prior, during, after. And, uh, and I've just, many, one of the jobs we had there was as people cleared battalion on their way back to the States, they had to come through us and uh, uh, then go wherever they went. After they cleared the 173rd, we were the place where we cleared them and they went to, you know, different uh, designation and went on home. So we got a lieutenant coming through and me and Benny got to clear him and, uh, uh, he still got his M16, and he ain't supposed to at this point in time. He should have given that up before he got dust. And I said, you know, Lieutenant, you know, you're not supposed to have your, your rifle. You should have turned it in already. He said, well, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need it for the niggas when I get back to the States. <laughs> and off he went. And then I, I hadn't thought of it up to that point. And uh, I said to Benny, I said, Benny, you know, I never hear you say a nigger or a spook or any of that stuff. He said, well, I ain't going to say nigger. I am one. What are you talking about, Ben? <laughs> you know, this guy's he's lighter skin than I am. He's got dark hair and it's it's you know, it's a tight curl to it. And we get to talk and his mom was mixed and his dad is mixed blood. He's got a, a sister as light as him, he's got a sister and a brother really dark. You know? And so it's, yeah, it's just a little <clears throat> side thing. You never know who you're talking to or, you know, or how things are and not that, you know, and I, yeah, every, you know, I, no matter what you think, I think everybody's got a little twinge of that racism in them, and, and, and it's, uh, it, it's probably just human nature. It's not innately evil. It's just survival of your kind type of thing. That's how I've equated it in my brain. But, uh, you know, the overt part of it, I pretty much feel I got rid of. And I don't know if that, up me in Benny's estimation or not, but it certainly didn't hurt me as it came to pass later on down the line, which I would like to think I was that Machiavellian, but uh, I wasn't. And, uh, anyway, they decided that they divvied, they, 173rd changed their base camp from Anke to Quinyan, and all the people that in Anke that were pushing papers for their various battalions now went back to their battalions. So now I'm shipped back up to LZ Uplift and I'm in the S1. And I'm a clerk in the S1. And uh, besides doing morning reports, I got to type up Article 15s, summaries, courts, special courts, whatever's coming down the pike for the guys that I've been in the field with. And I got to type up awards. And this is the honest truth and I thought it was a rarity since found out it wasn't. There was a lieutenant colonel, a battalion commander, that got him back to the States without his silver star. Come to find out, you know, and I, you're going to be hard pressed to find, out of the 173rd anyway, and I believe it's pretty much across the board in the Army, you're going to be hard pressed to find an officer 
a company grade officer in the infantry who doesn't have a bronze or better with V. It was almost like an automatic. Field grades got the silvers or better, automatic. They give me the scenario, I gotta type it up. I'm now I'm a fiction writer. The basic thing is uh, he landed a CNC chapter at great personal disregard to his own safety to extract a LERP team that was being pursued. You know, there's a silver star for you. And uh, come to find out, that's, you know, they, they should have just photocopied these things off because they, you look into the award, uh, uh, you know, the, what do they call that, the, the description of the award, and you're going to see a lot of, you know, LERP teams being extracted by CNC choppers. Uh, this is where it gets weird as far as, I can't do this anymore. In all honesty, and for what little bit of my soul that is left, I can't sit here and do this paperwork for them anymore. I, I can't type up these fraudulent awards. I can't type up disciplinary stuff against the guys I was in the field with. I'm not, I can't do it. I want to go back to the field. I, I mean, up to this point, you, you, this is probably the last thing you're expecting to hear out of me. But, uh, okay, I, I, I can't stay here, guys. I got to go back to the field. It's more honest out there. At least I know who's who and what's going on. And uh, they said, no, 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 no. Uh, I had, well, once I got in charge of my paperwork, I had, you know, now I rectified my E1 situation, and you know I'm an E2. I you could I wish I'd love to see it. I had a meteoric rise from E1 to E4. That's you know <laughs> it was like in no time. And now so and they said, well look, we're gonna we're gonna give you a hard five to stay here, not spec five. We're gonna give you a hard five. You're I, I was good at it. I knew what was important. I knew what wasn't, and I knew how to get it done on time. And I said, no, I, th I can't. I got to go. I, I, I'm going back. So they sent me back to the field. I go back to the same platoon, same gun team, except now I'm the assistant gunner uh, instead of the ammo bearer, which means I got 100 less rounds, which is wonderful, and one less can. Like, I, I think, I don't know if I gave you guys a picture of, there was a, there's a picture of me, the guy in front of me mm -hmm. took it, and I got a, there's a belt of ammo, classic. You know, John Wayne crap with belt of machine gun ammunition hanging around my neck. Well, that's when I was the assistant gunner. But he had jumping back to the... But like I said, it was a quiet... It had been too quiet. And, you know, they give me the, uh, the claymore to carry, not the clacker, the explosive part. Well, this don't feel right. There's nothing in it. I got an empty shell. The thing has been cannibalized for all its C4, and maybe they're shooting marbles with the ball bearings, but I, all I got is a Claymore shell. I mean, and I said, whoa, wait a minute, guys. It may be quiet out there, but uh, I don't want to carry around a, an empty, a, a, you know, I'm going to carry around some I want to, you know, this, is, this ain't right. And, uh, and it, was, it was just, it was, and this is only from like a February to a, a, a early May. It's only like a two-month gap, and it was like a whole different world of what was going on out there. And uh, now we, they started an NCO academy because they're running out of sergeants, and a lot of the the career sergeants, the guys that were staying in the army, a lot of them realized this war was crap, and they weren't going to, you know. However, they weren't going out to the field, so they started, a, somewhere along the line, they started an NCO academy, and I step in, come back into the company, and that's who I got as a platoon sergeant in the field, some 19-year-old honor graduate, E6 from the NCO academy, and a brand new second lieutenant from OCS who's just 20 years old, and neither one of them had a clue as to what you know, when they're in charge of my life, I'm and and they and they're giving me a claymore with no C4 in it, and uh, uh, you know, guys are carrying you know what a bandolier, seven magazines. They're carrying one bandolier of ammo, and uh, whoa, no, oh, guys, th this ain't right. And uh, uh, 
So then it's, well, time goes on and uh, uh, <laughs> we, uh, I didn't, I knew about the foliation. I mean, I knew it was something they did. I knew, but I'm, I'm not even sure if I knew what the word meant. Uh, I don't think I did. Uh, and I certainly didn't realize whatever implications were going to arise from it. But uh, we, were, we were on this little knoll that was vo devoid of any vegetation. Uh, and it was, it was a nasty odor, and and everybody got really. Uh, I mean, you always had the runs to some extent. You always, you know, you, you, you your whole digestive system doesn't work right. It doesn't work as it should in the field. And I don't, and mine certainly didn't. And uh, but and now everybody's, you know, ah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was just, I don't know if it was just been sprayed or what its story was, but it was that way. And I'm coming up on uh, uh, eight months in country, and Harry's coming up on ten months in country, and neither one of us had an R&R. &R. And uh helicopter comes in with resupply, and uh, I said, Harry, come on, let's get the hell out of here. And because uh, I thought I could get away with it, with who I knew in the rear, and uh, and I could and did. And uh, and I, it'd been a long time I had learned, you know, just if you think you can do it. If somebody doesn't want you to do it, they're going to jump in your face and tell you not to do it. But it, especially over there, there's a good chance nobody's going to say anything because they don't know what the hell's going on either. So uh, we both got on a helicopter and went back and pulled the strings. The next thing you know, we're off to Bangkok. And, uh, and that was something else that was I mean this is right when they landed on the moon time that July uh, uh, 69 and that's you know it's uh, I remember getting there and American moms maybe don't want to know about this but the first thing they did when you landed at your R&R &R place was they sat you in a little room and an army officer stood up in front of you and told you about the price range and of the prostitution and how that coincided with your chances of catching venereal disease. And that's what happened at Bangkok and from what I understand it's what happened at Kuala Lumpur and it happened at Tokyo and it happened everywhere you went. Then they hooked you up with the cab driver that would facilitate the, the prostitute for you. And uh, <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. I don't know if you remember the movie Apocalypse Now, but it starts off with Martin Sheen, who was wearing a 173rd patch, laying in his bed. Well, not wearing the patch, but he's 173rd assigned before he goes off to uh, kill Marlon Brando. He's laying in the bed in the room in Saigon with the fan going all over, and just you know, and you just kind of, that's what Bangkok was to me. I mean, I got the prostitute because you, you're supposed to get the prostitute, but I didn't keep the, the, the woman for the week. It's Turns out I'd rather buy women. I don't want to rent them. You know, I like to keep them. For, but, uh, you know, I just, uh, you know, it's, the R&R &R was, it was like a, whew, you know, a chance to catch your breath and, you know, think about, you know, what the hell am I doing? What's going on? You know, it's, uh, well, the R&R &R ended and I come back and now we're talking, it's about the oh, 27th of July, 69. And uh, my normal ETS is the 31st of July. I went in the 1st of August, 66. Here it is, the 27th of July, 69. You know, I got normal ETS, except I got five months bad time. You know, I got five months of stockade I got to make up. Well, that was from their point of view. My point of view was I gave you three years to kill me, the three years are up. And you may not have thought I was in the army for those five months in the stockade, but I certainly thought I was in the army. And uh, I told them, look, I'm not, I'm not pushing your papers, I'm not going back to the field. Well, you go to Leavenworth. Look, you already gave me one general court martial. Do whatever you got to do. I'm not doing it. I'm not going to be an ironic statistic. I've, I've been, a, you know, I heard enough about guys, you know, they, 
you know, they extend for whatever reason and get killed their first day. And I gave you three years. The three years, and they were going out to the field the next day, and they were going to be out past my normal ETS. I'm not going to be there. You guys can be there. I'm not going to be. Well, they holl hemmed and hawed and they hollered and moaned and groaned and, it, and Benny O'Donnell Taylor III, the PSNCO at this time, and now he's up to E7. Benny did pretty good by himself too with, uh, well, the PSNCO was supposed to be in E7 and, you know, he had enough time and uh, he went to E6, E7. Uh, they made me the battalion librarian. And for what it was worth, and I had a room about this big with about 1,500 paperbacks that nobody ever came to read. And uh, part of my job was also to show movies to the guys when they were in from the field. But the film wouldn't show up on time, the bulb would break, you know. I, that rarely happened, that I showed it to the larger audience, these animals would, you know, get all over you. Hey, Fuck you guys. I'm sorry the movie doesn't work right. You know, <laughs> go back to it. But I, what I would do is when my guys, my platoon was in for the field, we would show it on the wall of my of this room, my library room. And uh, it was up on this little knoll. And, uh, and, and you'd show 35 millimeter in this format, and you got clarity that, I mean, this is a beautiful picture. And uh, uh, I wound up being called The Fool on the Hill, and uh, uh, it's, my army career went off in another direction, and they were just happy to, to not have me, because now I'm starting to talk about, you know, what are we doing here, and I, you know, they were happy to have me, S1's down there, the library's over there, let's get them over there. He ain't worth court martial, and that's going to be a pain in the ass too, because he found out that if you apply for CO status while you're in the field, you got to pull him for six months to evaluate him. We don't want him spreading that around. We're just going to stick him up there, and, you know. But then I run into this guy that's who's leaving this lunatic. I can't remember his name. It might have been Johnson. He might have been a lunatic before I became the lunatic there, and he turns me on to this book of. Leo Tolstoy's writings on civil disobedience and nonviolence. Now every five pages I'm running down to S1. Benny, you got to read this. You <laughs> and it's just, uh, it's, it's just craziness. And the, the engineers, like I, I had to, the engineers had running water at, at LZ Uplift. They had showers, they had shower heads, they had toilets, they had running water. We had to hump when we came in from the field, we had to fill the five-gallon cans, climb it up a ladder, dump it in this thing, let the sun heat it if you wanted to wait that long, and then pull a string and, you know. But these guys were militant about their showers, and, it, and I became a, a shower commando. I had to, because I'm not humping water up a ladder and waiting two hours, and so I'm sneaking into their showers every day, and uh, it, it really, you know, I, 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 I'm... I don't, I'm not even wearing boots anymore. I'm, you know, it's, it just, it was, it's hard to explain. It, it people, so, you know, people that are never in the military or certainly never in Vietnam and, and never at these little outlying posts, you know, that couldn't have been. Yeah, it, it could have been, and it was. It was, I mean, it was, when we went to the bigger camps, they took our weapons away from us. They didn't want to let us walk around with weapons at camera or, or anywhere. No, no, you guys, no, are you kidding me? You're not going anywhere near civilized people with an M16, you know, and, uh, and that's how I, I, I finished out. And then my brother, he writes, I had been writing him. I was going to jump back a bit when I was on K. The casualty, we used to get the casualty reports because that was part of what you had to enter in a morning report. The WIAs, the KIAs, you had to enter that in because now this person's status has changed. The WIA is either just going to get a heart out of it or else he's off to the hospital. So my brothers, we're writing back and forth, and he had been thinking about getting out, but his opportunities, he barely, same as me, barely got out of high school, even though he's an officer. It's, you know, nobody's really jumping to hire a, a leftover airborne infantry captain. And, uh, you know, he's 
reaching that break point where he's got the 10 years and, you know, what am I going to do? And he's still a young guy. He's only 27 or so. And, uh, and you know, he's having an horn, but then he decides he's going to have his wife. I got to go down to the funeral of his ex father in law later today. Uh, his wife wants him out. She's a woman that needs a man around. And she's tired of him hopping back and forth. And he just keeps getting shot anyway. And, you know, every time he comes back, he's more damaged. And the casualty report comes in. And it was, I think it was the 3rd Battalion. And it was a platoon from the 3rd Battalion. And it goes down. It's like 25. 26 guys. You want to stop for a bit? No. It goes, and it's every one of them. Just pick it up and hang it up. I don't know if you've ever... It's unplugged. It's unplugged? Receiver is off. Uh, a casualty report, like let's say uh, it's a KIA. It would be KIA, and then it gives what happened. And like a, a gunshot is a GSW. And then it says, where in the body, boom, you know, GSW, torso, G, you know, WIA, shrapnel. I forget what the shrapnel letters were, but anyway, this, the other letters stick in my mind. As, as I, I'm going down, it's a whole platoon, private so-and-so, spec force, well, sergeant, you know, lieutenant, staff sergeant, KIA, GSW head, KI, GSW head, GSW head, GSW, the whole platoon. You know, the story comes out that they had been uh, mortared and hand grenaded the night. And then, you you know, you can, you can envision it. And, you know, thankfully I've never anything close happened to me. But, you know, I use this analogy. I peeked through the door. You know, these guys peeked through the door and jumped into the room. You know, but I, I peeked through the door. I see what's in the room and that's good enough. And uh, uh, the whole platoon, they mortared, grenaded, and then the Vietnamese just swept through. You know, some of them were already dead, the rest of them were wounded, some of them ain't dead yet at all. And the Vietnamese just come through and psh, 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 pop them all on the head. The whole platoon's wiped out, except one guy who crawled off into the bushes and they found him three days later. Uh, uh, when they got out there, they found him. So, you know, these, this is stuff that's, uh, uh, you know, Militarily uh, uh, confidential. That's not, not the right word, but anyway. It's, so I sent, I sent, I sent it back to my brother. I said, Dennis, what are you doing? Why are you coming over here? This shit is still happening. You don't want to be, you know. You ain't, you ain't learned nothing yet. And this is back in well April or so. But you know, he's on his. He's he wants he wants to be a colonel. He wants to be a general, and he's got to have that combat command time. And he's coming back. So while I'm the battalion librarian, uh, I, I get a letter from him that I, I forget if the letter said I'm leaving the States or the letter was as soon as he got there, you know, and he landed down south and then he's going up to uh, Wei Fu Bai to take over company commander at this LZ Tomahawk. And uh, so I go to Benny, I said, hey, you know, what's the Sullivan law, you know, what's this thing? Uh, I told him to stay home, he didn't stay home, he's here. I want out. And, uh, you know, Benny, he'd he write up the paperwork, whatever I need, and I'm taking that with me, and I got my passes, and I'd go to uh, An Ke and then to Quinn Yan, and then I, I think I, out of there, or maybe I flew right out of An Ke to Da Nang. I, I don't remember how I got up to Wei Fu Bai, via Da Nang, I think. And then I landed someplace. I didn't land at Wei Fu Bai. I landed... That can't be. I landed somewhere south of there and then went the rest of the way by truck. And I hook up with my brother at, uh, I think it might have been E Company, 2nd 327th. I'm not sure. Uh, it might have been even 502. I don't, I, I don't remember. But I, had, I got myself a, a set of jungle fatigues and I got my 173rd on it and I had it, my jump wings and my CIB and but they couldn't, anyway. <coughs> I get up there and uh, I hook up with Dennis and uh, I bought a camera. To, Benny wanted me to buy a camera. Benny wanted a camera. He wanted me to buy it. I, I said, well, look, I'll buy it, but I want to take some pictures. 
<coughs> my camera, I forget, I guess I had lost it. Or I don't know what had happened to it at that point. I didn't have it anymore. I would have had my own camera. So I bought Benny's camera at a big PX someplace along the line, and I had some pictures taken with me and my brother, and then I had trouble getting the film out, and I exposed all that film, so I never had those pictures. But uh, this, my brother had taken over the Selzy Tomahawk, and uh, this place had just been overrun like a month before. And uh, it was a National Guard unit activated out of Bardstown, Kentucky. This is, I mean, I, I knew the basics of it then. This is stuff I pieced together afterwards. Uh, I, got a, uh, I got a wall of Vietnam books, and I've, I've read most of them, and some of them I've read more than once. Because I, I got back, and uh, I said to myself, well, i got to find out what the hell happened. How did I wind up 12,000 miles away from my home, humping machine gun ammunition up and down mountains in a tropical rainforest, trying to kill little brown rice farmers that live in houses made out of vegetation? I don't know what the hell happened or how that happened to me. i got to find out. And I started reading on Vietnam and uh, got into America's whole Asian policies and the old China hands and I'm taking, you know, I'm going to college and uh, all I want is history. Well, you got to matriculate. I don't even know what that word means. So what do you mean I got to do that? Well, you got to take this. And you know, I don't want to take that. I got no reason to want to take that stuff. I just want to take history. And I had, I wound up with an old China hand as a history teacher down at Nassau Community College. Uh, he was a Marine, uh, uh, I forget his name, but anyway, I found, I since found out about, in this Bardstown, Kentucky, it was like the largest, when they got overrun, I have 16 KIAs or whatever, it was, a, it was a substantial number, and it devastated this town in Kentucky, and it was the largest National Guard hit of the whole Vietnam War, and uh, my brother stepped in, and he's the next company commander of this unit, that's what's left of them, and how to and they've been reformed and fleshed out with whatever they got people from. And Dennis, you know, from the writing back and forth, uh, he knew where my head was going on the whole war. And he told me, look, you know, keep it to yourself. <laughs> These guys are not happy to begin with. The last thing they knew is need is to hear something from you. In fact, don't leave the bunker, just stay <laughs> in here with me. And I was happy to see him. And so, I, you know, I, I, you know, that's what we did. And, uh, uh, then I left and I went back and uh, uh, I'm waiting around for the paperwork to, and it, you know, it seems like it's taken forever. And then finally it comes through and uh, you know, so now I'm going to leave LZ Pony and go back to Brigade Base Camp and then from, and wait for some more paperwork and then from, well then wait for a flight and then go home. And uh, so I'm, I'm going to clear country and uh, clear the base camp and uh, oh no, you you couldn't have your mustache below your lip line. Why well, your mustache? You know, you guys, okay, I trim my mustache. Well, now your hair's too long. Yeah, I trim my hair. Well, now, you know, your mustache looks like it may have grown a little bit since you're, well, you know. So the, I got an M79 at this point. When I got out of the field, they took the 16, but uh, I kept an M79 in my little room in the library. And I had a reputation of being, you know, not the tightest rap person. So now I'm walking around with my papers with my M79 and a, and a high explosive round in it. So they finally sign off everything and off I go to Quinyan. And I get to Quinyan and uh, uh, there was a guy that had been in my platoon. When I got there in January, uh, Jesse, he was out of Texas, Jesse Minix, uh, he finished his tour up maybe around in March or April and then he ex took a 30-day leave and extended, and now he's the lifeguard at the brigade swimming pool in Quignan. So, uh, you know, I, once again, I, I know what I can get away with and what I can't get away with, and I'm not staying in the barracks pulling KP and picking up cigarette butts and doing this other crap. I'm hanging out with Jesse, and I'm swimming every day, waiting for my final papers to come through, and they finally do, and, and off I go, and I take off, and... Uh, 
Atlanta to Fort Lewis, and I'm fully, I still got, at this point, well, not quite three months, but close, closer to three than two months of bad time left. And you're always, you're always told, you know, you're gonna, you, if you got bad time, you're pulling every day of it. Your early outs don't count for bad time. You got bad time, you're pulling bad time. I didn't care. I now I'll, I'll, you know, I'll try and skate. I don't think I'm going to know anybody in this situation, but I'm going to try and skate as much as I can. But if I got a poor KP for two months and then get out of the army, fine. I'd rather do that in on the west coast of the United States than the east coast of Asia. And I'm going through the lines and I'm doing this and they're doing that. Next thing I know, I walk out the door and I'm, I think I'm out of the army. <laughs> Yep, I'm pretty sure I'm out of the army. And uh, like I said, I had given myself 45 days leave when I left Bragg. So, and there was no way I was going to accumulate 45 days leave. And uh, and I got my last pay stub, and it says on it, I'm satisfactorily in debt. And uh, But they had to give me enough money to fly home, which they did. And uh, and you could always make a little bit on that because you got the half fare for the uniform. and. Their travel mileage, you know, was, they gave me like $194. I forget what it cost me to get home, but I had a little bit left over. And my parents didn't know I was coming home, and I came into uh, Kennedy and landed about uh, midnight, one in the morning, and uh, took a cab. I lived about seven miles from Kennedy, and uh, uh, I knocked on the door. And, you know, well, first I went to the local bar, and, you know, with my uniform. And, hung out with some of my friends that were hanging out and uh, uh, then I went home and knocked on the door because I didn't have a key and they lock at night and scared the, you know, scared them and scared me and that was that and that was, that was the end of the army and uh, I started going, I jumped into school the first semester that January of 70 and uh, I jumped right into Vets for Peace and uh, they weren't confrontational enough for me, and I couldn't find VVAW, Vietnam Veterans Against the War. Everything seemed to, on the East Coast, it seemed like they were all on the West Coast. And I got out to the West Coast, and it seemed like they were all on the East Coast. But I ran into them on the West Coast. Uh, anyway, I went to school, and then Kent State happened that spring of 70, and all the colleges closed down. And uh, I was... I was I was just outraged. I, I felt I had been used. Uh, I felt, you know, not just me, all of us. Uh, uh, and I mean, like I said before about bait, of course that's all we were was bait. None of it, you, 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 we don't give a thought to it. Like I'm saying, I'm carrying 400 rounds for this machine gun. And the other ammo bearer's got 400 rounds. That's 800. The assistant gun has got three 350. So now we're up to 11. 50, 11, 11, 50, and the gun has got maybe two. So tops, we got 1,400 rounds for a weapon that puts out close to 700 rounds a minute. So for all this agony, we're putting on our bodies. If the shit hits the fan, we don't have three minutes of bullets. So what are we if we're certainly not there for a prolonged battle? We're there, so, you know, we're just there to start. We're, we're there to sucker punch the guy to start the barroom brawl. And uh, that's the only way I could think of it. And, uh, you know, and, I, and I've never been reluctant to talk about it, and I don't feel I'm unpatriotic either. I, 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 always, I always felt used. I always felt used. I mean, granted, I, was, I could have been a better soldier, but I don't think I was that bad a one either. Uh, I, I, actually, I developed a deep... I got a chance to, to meet uh, the Vice President of Vietnam back in uh, 1982, I think I just pieced together. And uh, my government had it up to that point, and uh, I wrote my own apology. I hand wrote, I wrote my own apology uh, to the people of Vietnam for waging war against them. And I had an opportunity to present it to uh, Nguyen Koh Tak, who was the vice president, vice premier at the time, and uh, you know he was very gracious about it. And uh, and I never, you know, it, it, 
people, oh, you gotta hate them, they killed your brother. No, I don't, I don't, ha I don't even hate the guy that fired the missile that killed my brother. You know, and uh, I'm supposed to hate this guy for defending his own land. No, if anything, I hate the people that made, caused an economic situation where that's where my brother thinks the only thing. There's a la one of the last letters my brother writes home, and my, the guy got it somewhere. And uh, he says in it, he says to my parents, he says, you know, he's starting to, you know, maybe, maybe Pat, maybe Pat isn't wrong. Uh, you know, he's starting to have his own questions. And I got all the, I got a stack of pictures. You know, I brought some pictures in of my brother, but I got the pictures my brother took. And I've seen, you know, there's pictures, you know, the guy's standing on bodies like it's an African safari and, uh, you know, and a, you know, they got ears and they got, there's a guy, a good friend of mine, it's not a little side story, I'm not, I won't mention his name, uh, he wore a finger, he wore an NBA finger around his neck, and his debate was whether he was going to eat it or not, whether he was going to go into that cannibal realm, but he wore it, it was like a dried up looking uh, cheese doodle. Uh, anyway, he was, uh, he was Sky Soldier of the Month, and he was, and he was, going back to the States, and uh, uh, he, he, he knew he was going to the 82nd. I wrote back to the people I knew at the 82nd. I had forgotten all about this stuff. I wrote back to the people I knew in the 82nd. I told him, hey, look out for this guy when he shows up, you know. If you can do anything for him, do something for him. You know, he's a pretty good guy, you know. He was a young guy. I mean, I, I didn't think any, this is where, it got, I mean, when you don't think something bad about a guy wearing a finger around his neck, you, 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 you've gone through the looking glass. There's something different going on here. And uh, so anyway, I broke back and I, you know, it, this guy left and I never thought nothing about it afterwards. So then I, I when I went down to the dedication of the wall in Washington, uh, I went to the 173rd hospitality suite and I signed my name, and ever since then I get these 173rd uh, organization uh, booklets. Uh, you know, they have their mailings, and they have a locator thing in there. So I'm going. I always look. I never see anybody from my unit. I see this guy, and it says where he is, and I look it all up, and I call. He's a lawyer, and I call him up, and he can't thank me. And what do you? Th you know, I don't know. Turns out. When he got to the Bragg, the guys I knew at Bragg uh, flagged him, got him out of that whole thing. They were just starting the uh, 82nd Airborne Museum at Bragg. They turned him into the curator. He's got nothing to do because paratroopers are not, you know, they're at the bars. They're not at the museum. They're at the do drop in down at Fayetteville, you know, and they're mm -hmm. puking in the gutter. They're not looking at the... Uh, He's got nothing to do all day. He starts going to college uh, while he's at Bragg, and he, you know, he, he's good at it. He goes on and he becomes, a, he becomes a lawyer, and he's thanking me for all this. And I had even, you know, I just looked. I saw his name. I had forgot that I had even set him up. You know, it was, uh, yeah, so I got, a, I got a lawyer if I ever need one. I hope I have. <laughs> uh, so I, I, I don't know. I got myself involved with being our veterans against the war, and uh, uh, I may, I don't know if you, you, you know the name Ron Kovic, uh, mm -hmm. born on the 4th of July. I traveled across the country with him on, uh, uh, I was in the San Francisco contingent of EVAW. He was in a Los Angeles contingent, and uh, uh, actually I think it started with Redwood City, and then we came down through Los Angeles. And, and we went across uh, US 10, across the southern part of the Republican Convention in 72 in Miami. And a group came out of Boston and they grabbed the New Yorkers and some came out of Chicago and we all met in Jacksonville and went on down to Miami and uh, uh, there was a, you know, barely got reported in the Miami papers, let alone anywhere else. I mean, you control the media, you can control you really can control what people think. If you don't, you know, and there were a thousand people arrested down there. 
never, nobody knows about this. Everybody knows about Chicago, and they learn their lesson in Chicago. They just shut down the media for Miami, so nobody hears about it. There was a group of us. We went out to the. We went out to the. Uh, uh, a stadium out on the Keys. There was a young Republican for Nixon rally. We went out there in jungle fatigues and toy M16s. And we we're going to do some guerrilla theater. And we got a flatbed truck, uh, and uh, that's what we're all in. And I don't know why we thought they were going to let us in, but we thought they would, and they didn't. And we got there, and they said, "No, you guys ain't coming in." Then they turned us around and sent us back on the causeway back to Miami. Well, we don't get too far, and we get pulled over. And uh, supposedly for a faulty taillight, which wasn't the case. Then we all get told, okay, you got to get off the truck. Then as soon as we get off the truck, we got arrested for being pedestrians on the causeway. And uh, well, now I'm in Miami-Dade County Jail, and uh, there's a video. It was, this whole thing was filmed, not that aspect of it, but the whole VVAW thing was filmed, and uh, it was called The Last Patrol. Well, we called it The Last Patrol, and so the documentary was called The Last Patrol. And uh, in that Last Patrol, they mentioned a guy by the name of Jack McCloskey, who since died, uh, mentioned about how seven of the brothers were arrested last night, and that was us. And, but part of that Last Patrol, footage of that was lifted and then reenacted by Tom Cruise uh, for the movie Born on the Fourth of July. Uh, so the last patrol is, is the real Ron Kovic and the Born on the Fourth of July is, you know, Hollywood's Ron Kovic with Tom Cruise. But uh, it was part of, and Tom Cruise did a phenomenal. Ron got into the convention hall. I was just talking with a lady the other day and she was telling me about the Vietnam veterans getting spit on. I said, I don't know about that. I never got spit on. And I've heard it so much. And I've, you know, if, if you scraped all that spit, you'd probably fill a little lake. I don't know of anybody that was spit on. Kovic and the other guy, Bob Muller, I don't know if you know Bob, know that name, Bob Muller, he's founder of Vietnam Veterans of America. Remember a couple of years ago, there was a woman who won the Nobel Peace Prize having to do with uh, landmine issues? Oh, yeah. That was Bob's organization. It was through Bobby that I got the... Uh, uh, meet the Vietnamese. We used to get invited, invited down to the Vietnamese when they opened their mission each year uh, down in Manhattan uh, before they got full membership in the UN. Uh, so it was, it was another, it was, being from that area, it was a contingent of us from here that went down. <laughs> and uh, being from the area, I was supposed to be the navigator. So it's okay, I get us there. And it's an open bar. Oh my God, i never been to an open bar. I'd never been to a situation where there was an open bar. And I got shrimp and I got this and that and everything. I don't know if it was the time I uh, gave uh, the Vice Premier my apology or one of the other years. Uh, I think it might have been the first year. And then the second year I realized, okay, I, this is something I can do. And the, the apology part, so I did it the second year. But uh, you got an open bar. And I'm knocking down the rums and cokes. And, eating the shrimp and, and you know, oh. so we're driving back and I'm not navigating too well and now we're lost somewhere on a major deacon in the Bronx and the, and we're in a van and I go, oh, guys, you got, I, I got to pull over. You got to pull over. I, unless you want to look and smell it, a lot of puke, you got to pull over. So uh, they pull over and they open up the door and we're on a, you know, expressway in a, a lane you ain't supposed to be in. Uh, it's certainly not stopped, and the, uh, I don't know this. A trooper pulls up, and now there's a trooper standing next to me. And he's like, what are you doing here? What are you doing? Oh, it's, you know, it's, what the hell do you think I'm doing? And they throw up all over his shoes. <laughs> and uh, then the other guys are in the van. They came out and said, hey, officer, you know, it's, you know, they waved the veteran flag, and we were allowed to get out of there without further trouble. But... Uh, I thought it was interesting. Okay, well, we're at the end of this tape. Okay, thank you very much for your interview. You're welcome.